So I guess you liked it? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. So um, we have some mics down here. Please, if you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to, to go up to them and um, I'll call you out. Um, I have a couple as well. Um, so we interviewed uh, Keith on our show, Radio West. Doug spoke with him last week. And um, we record the show now, uh, which is new for us. And um, afterwards, after Doug had thanked Keith for joining us, um, you shared a, really, a couple of really touching stories um, about the, the song uh, that runs during your credits, Claire de Lune, the WC song. Um, I wonder if you'd start by sharing both those songs, both those stories, please. Sure. Um, well, you know, it's, it's, we did the interview uh, with Doug, and I don't know how long it lasted. Was it an hour? Yes. It should be. Yeah. We yeah. talked, and there were some clips, and some of you, I know, uh, heard the interview. Um, and after the interview ended, we kept talking, um, and, uh, and Doug asked me a question that some people have asked at, at some Q&As, not always, but sometimes people ask me about the, the use of Claire de Lune, um, which is the music that we use um, when the, the policemen are confronting the sniper and ending the siege, and then it plays again here during the credits. Um, and, uh, and that's, I always appreciate when people ask about that, because it's, uh, there's a lot of things that go into making a film like this that people in the audience will never know about, why we made certain decisions, what they mean to us. Um, and that's one that, why we use Claire de Lune is not meant for you to know unless you ask, and if you ask, I'm happy to share. Um, so here we are. Uh, we made a conscious decision, as you just saw, not to tell the story of the sniper. Um, that wasn't a decision we came to lightly. Um, as a documentary filmmaker, I believe in research, and I did a ton of research. Um, and to be honest, the easiest research to do is research about the sniper. And if, if any of you go home tonight, uh, or pull out your phones now, and Google Texas Tower shooting, what you'll get is a lot of websites and a lot of places that want to tell you the story of Charles Whitman, the sniper. Um, we took in all of that information and realized at some point, about a year into what was a four-year process, that we wanted to stay focused on the, the witnesses, the victims, and the heroes of that day. And by telling his story, we couldn't honor their stories without distracting. Um, so we didn't tell his story. Um, but there is a part of his story that connects to that music that I had a hard time letting go of. And uh, the film, as you may have seen in the credits, is, is uh, partially based on an article in Texas Monthly Magazine by incredible reporter Pamela Koloff, who interviewed dozens of people who were on the ground that day. And I read that article 10 years ago on the 40th anniversary of the tower shooting. It was the reason I decided to make the film was that article. And that article tells the story of Claire, it tells the story of Ray Martinez, the cop who, uh, one of the two cops who ended the siege, and, and others. It also tells a lot of information about the sniper, and that's where we diverted from the article. But there's an anecdote in the article, and basically it's a story uh, by Barton Riley, who is um, Charles Whitman's advisor in the architecture school. And he said a, a few weeks before the shooting, he was at home, it was 11 o'clock at night, and someone was banging on his front door. He was very surprised by this. He went to the front door, and it was his student, Charles Whitman, um, he was surprised because he'd never had a student show up at his house before, and he certainly never had one show up at 11 o'clock at night. And the student basically kind of walked into the house, and he said he was red-faced, he was breathing heavily, he was clearly frustrated and upset, and he told his advisor, I'm having problems in my personal life, problems in my academic life, I need some help getting an extension on an assignment. And the professor said he had just never had a student be so exasperated and he's there in his home, and he said, Whitman looked over and noticed in the corner of the room a piano. And he looked at his professor and he said, can I play your piano? And of course it was 11 o'clock at night and Barton Riley's wife was asleep upstairs, but he said, sure, you can play the piano. And Whitman went over to the piano and he played what Barton Riley said was the most beautiful version of Claire de Lune he'd ever heard. And 
that just really struck me, that idea that this person that we look at, that so many people look at as a monster, was actually a human being, and he had problems, and he had conflicts, but while he played Claire de Lune, Riley said the red drained from his face, his breathing regulated, and when he finished the composition, he stood up and he looked at him and he said, you know, that's all I really needed. And in that moment, Charles Whitman had found peace. And all these years later, we're making this film and we've decided not to tell his story. And there's a part of me that feels regret because I couldn't figure out how to include his greater humanity in this complicated film that we were putting together. And it occurred to me the only time in our film when he finds any peace is at the end of his life at the hands of the two police officers who bravely confronted him. And so we chose to use Claire de Lune at that moment. Thanks. There are so many just deeply humane stories and, and acts of heroism. And, and I think one, one of the one of those acts that, that is so affecting in this film is Claire's act of forgiveness. Um, and he killed her husband, her unborn child, and yet still she finds it in her heart to forgive, to forgive him. Can you talk about that, that moment when, when she told you that? What, what yeah. did you think about that? What was that conversation like for you? It was really surprising. Um, I mean, the way it plays in the film is very much the way I experienced it. It was an organic moment in the interview. Um, that Life magazine that she's looking at in the film is something that I carried that magazine with me to all of my interviews um, because it's such an incredible reference tool. It has a map of campus that shows where everyone was shot and it has photos of all of the people who were killed that day and, um, and lists their names. And I probably should have just photocopied it instead of carrying around this great you know, document um, in my laptop bag everywhere I went. But for like a year, that magazine lived with me and so every interview I would, I would have it with me and sometimes I would pull it out and reference something in it. And that's what happened on that day. We were taking a little break. Um, my interview with Claire lasted um, about three hours. And so we would take a break about every 45 minutes or so. And on the break I'd pulled out the magazine to check something. And Claire saw the magazine and she said, oh, can I look at that Life magazine? It has my favorite picture of Charles Whitman in it. And yeah, that's what I said. Uh, so, <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean, Claire? And she said, well, give it to me. And she opened it up, and this is, the cameras weren't rolling. Um, she opened it up, and she... Get the cameras rolling. She turned... Yeah, that was the next. <laughs> she turned to that picture, and she said, look at him. Look at him. He's a three-year-old little boy. Isn't, he's just such a darling little boy. And I said, all right, let's get the cameras rolling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, so I, we did it again on the interview, and I handed her the magazine, and I said, talk to me about that. And she told me what she says in the film, you know, um, that he was an innocent child and that she recognizes that innocence and she sees in him um, potential and, and possibility and it makes her so sad what became of him. And uh, that's the moment you hear my voice say, do you forgive him, Claire? And believe me, I tried every way I could to like include that scene but cut my own voice out of it um, because we don't do that anywhere else in the film, but it just wasn't possible to get to her forgiveness without me asking that question and I realized, I think that's a question that a lot of people might ask in that moment when, when she had set that up. Um, I'm amazed by Claire. Like Claire is somebody I've become very close with. Uh, and she does forgive him. And she suffered this traumatic loss. You know, I was born nine years after the tower shooting. I don't have a direct connection to it except that I grew up in Texas, that I went to the University of Texas. Um, I have yet to forgive him. But I'd like to someday because when I see the way that Claire lives her life, I'm inspired by it and I think she's right. I think the only way forward is forgiveness. It just seems out of reach um, sometimes. I was with, I was with her yesterday. Um, we were in Los Angeles um, yesterday for the TV Critics Association um, review. Tower is gonna be um, broadcast on PBS on, on uh, February 14th. And so Claire, myself, thank you. Um, 
Claire, myself, Art Lee, the young man who saved her, and Ray Martinez were all in Los Angeles, and we did a panel in front of a group of reporters, and one of the reporters asked, if Whitman hadn't been killed, what would you like to say to him today? And Ray Martinez answered first, and he said, he went up there to be killed, so I have nothing to say to him because he didn't intend to live and he doesn't live, so I don't want to talk to him. Artley said, I don't look at him as a man. I look at him as a force of nature, and that force of nature rained down terror on our campus and on our community, and you can't talk to a force of nature, so I wouldn't have anything to say to him. And then Claire said, this is just less, less than 24 hours, or about 24 hours ago, she said, I'd love to hug him. I'd love to put my arms around him, and I'd love to tell him I'm so sorry for what happened to you to get you to that point. If you research him, you might find that um, Charles Whitman was known to be uh, incredibly racist. And Claire brought that up. She said, I know that he was a very racist man, and having racism in your life like that is a disease. I know that he grew up in a family that was not ideal. And I just wanted to, to reach out and hug him, and I would love to let him know I'm trying my best to understand. And I'm sitting up there on the stage in front of all the critics, and I feel like the tears rolling down my cheek. I've known Claire for four years, and I've heard her say things like that seven or eight times. I don't fully understand, but I'd like to. Wonderful. Any, any questions in the audience? No? <laughs> yes, ma'am? The process of the animation over the archival footage, could you discuss that, please, and how it came about? That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, the question was, can I discuss the process of the animation? So the animation, um, there's archival footage which was shot on that day. There were 14 minutes of archival footage, and I was aware of that from a very early stage. Um, before I even decided to make a film, I had done just a little bit of research on my own, um, and I'd seen the, this great archival footage um, but that footage is shot from great distance. Those brave cameramen who were there on campus were wise enough to hide behind trees and walls and stuff. Um, so it's kind of long lens footage or wide angle footage. And I knew immediately on um, deciding to make this film while I was reading that article. And I really recommend, if you're at all interested, it's called 96 Minutes. It's available widely online, um, Texas Monthly. And, uh, and while I was reading the article, all the stories are so visceral. They're so immediate, they're in the moment, and they're geographic. I, I went to the University of Texas and I know exactly what people mean when they say, I left the student union, I ran across the West Mall, I ducked behind Parlin Hall and cut through the architecture school. I mean, those are the, that was my stomping grounds. And I, I, so I placed myself there. And so as I was reading the article, I was imagining a version of what y'all just saw. And so the idea of making an animated film was the initial idea. That wasn't something we came to later. That was the idea. Um, I've worked with that animation before. As a matter of, I was working in that animation at that exact time, 10 years ago, on my first documentary, um, which is called The Eyes of Me, and it's about blind teenagers. And I used that animation to explore what it is to be blind. Um, and so I loved the fact that you had, you had so much control with the animation of creating a world. And I was reading these great stories from these people that were true and they were authentic, and I just wanted to match that authenticity with a visual medium that would transport us 50 years back in time, that would place us geographically in that space. Um, so the process is a multi-step process, um, and I'll, I'll do it briefly. Uh, I interviewed the real people who were there, Claire, Artley, Ray, the rest of them. Um, those white backdrop interviews that, that are, make up the final third of the film, that was the first step. Then I took the transcripts from that, those interviews and I opened up a screenwriting software and I wrote a screenplay. And it reads just like any screenplay for any fiction film with the fact that it's all nonfiction. Every word in there is from those interviews, is from the mouths of the people who were there. And every action they take is verified by them. Um, then we took photos of the real people from 1966, and we had a casting session with a casting director, and we brought in actors. I live in Austin, Texas. We have a great film community, a great theater community. And so all those actors are relatively unknown local actors. 
and they read for the parts, and we read people based on whether they looked similar to the real people in 1966, but more importantly, whether they could communicate the stories of these real people, because I knew at some point we would hand off from the animated avatars of these people to the real people. And my hope was that we could do that in a way where you felt like those young people were those old people. Um, then we took those cast actors and we went and shot the film in live action. Um, and that's how rotoscoping works. Uh, this is rotoscoped animation, which means there's a, an actual live action piece of video, it's edited, and then we hand it to the animators, and the animators painstakingly paint 12 individual frames per second to equal that black and white, or sometimes color, animated look. Um, and you've got a video of this that you can... I do, yeah. Uh, our, I've been putting together bonus features for our DVD, and uh, I can show you the way it looks. Um, there's a split-screen video that shows the live-action actors on one side and the animated end result on the other. Um, part of the reason we did the animation um, was also because the University of Texas would never allow us to film this on campus. I was wondering that. Some of the tower shots and stuff? Yeah, that know. stuff is mostly shot in my backyard. <laughs> Um, <laughs> with this animation, you could literally shoot anywhere. We could shoot, huh. we could shoot the scene right here. I mean, the, the actors are there. They're dressed in wardrobe. Um, they're, whatever props they're holding, they're, they're really holding. And, and I match the lighting. Huh. You know, I mean, it's pretty bright up here, so this could match like a hot Texas day. <laughs> um, but then the background could be replaced. And what I would do is we would shoot, the whole film is shot handheld, so we'd shoot in my backyard or in a parking lot or in a park. Um, and then we would edit those scenes, and I always knew, okay, you're here, and the tower's there. Hmm. In my backyard, we have a 40-foot tall palm tree in the corner, and that became the tower. <laughs> and it was, there's your eye line, there's the tower, there's Parlin Hall. Don't mind my dog, which is peeing over there in the corner of the yard. Um, that's the student union. Um, and, uh, and then I would go to campus, and I would recreate those shots hmm. with my iPhone. And I would walk around and shoot the background. Because you can get away with that. Because nobody's paying attention. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then that's where the anim I mean, the animators are just incredibly gifted artists and skilled technicians as well. And so I would give them, here's the foreground action, here's the background plates, we call them, the background locations, and they would put them together. Uh, ben, you asked me outside, why does the animation have kind of a floaty quality? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be as floaty as it is, but that floatiness kind of helps um, mask the hmm. difference between the foreground and the background being actually shot in different times and places. Okay, interesting. So that's, that, that's the process. Um, it is not an easier process than others. It is not a less expensive process than others. But it's an impactful process that hasn't been overutilized. And uh, I like to think that it's successful because it's disarming. It's surprising a little bit. And it's also got a dreamlike quality to it. Mm -hmm that speaks to, you know, this film is about memory. It's 50 year old memories. And there's a fuzzy nature to memory. Memory is very fallible and I wanted, I'll be the first to acknowledge that. I wanted the animation to acknowledge that too. Great. Yes, ma'am? Yes, thank you. you. You bring out a point of um, memory and it was amazing to me, several of the people said they'd never talked about this. And I think that your movie brings out the importance of talking about these situations that have been traumatic for us in our lives and what a difference that might make for us as a human beings if we dealt with that. Yeah, jumping off that comment a bit, why do you, why do you think it was that people didn't talk about this? Is it something about Texas culture or the, the kind of infamy of this day in, in in cultural lore? Yeah, you know, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that completely. I mean, I think some of it is maybe regional to Texas or the South or the West. Some of it is generational. You know, I think about that, uh, that, that kind of famous poster uh, from, I think it's from World War I, but it kind of became famous in the last couple of years, uh, Keep Calm and Carry On. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that that's good advice. Um, uh, mate, sometimes you don't you freak need, out, but right. But sometimes some things are worth getting a little upset about, yeah. and, and sometimes you need to stop and acknowledge what's going on and, and confront it. Um, the you know, Artley says in the film, classes were closed for one day. They cleaned up the blood and they got back to it. Um, 
There's no mention of the tower shooting in the yearbook from 1966. There was no acknowledgement of it at the graduation that year. Um, it's, honestly, it's impossible to imagine that kind of response today. Yeah. I don't have an answer, I wasn't around, um, but I do think that, uh, I don't think it's healthy. And so, I didn't know that the film was going to be about that when we set out to make it, mm -hmm. but that is very much, to me, what it became about is overcoming trauma and I think the way you overcome a trauma is you acknowledge it and you, you engage with it. And that's expressed in the film by the two cousins. Yeah. Who, yeah. That, that, how it aided them. Um, uh, yes, sir, go ahead. Hi. Oh, Keith, th Keith, thank you so much. Uh, thank I, you. I, I just think it's an Oscar-worthy piece of work. Thank you. Um, I, wanna go, I don't really want to concentrate on, on Whitman, but I have one question. Is it true that the coroners discovered that he had a brain tumor? Uh, that's a great question, and Google will be happy to answer it for you. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. there's so many different, some say that he did, some say that he didn't. Exactly, so. and, and, and I'm happy to talk one-on-one. -on -one. I know all about it. Okay. There are various uh, findings and controversies. Okay. Um, this is my, that's whether a film, he, That's a film in itself. Well, it is, and the question to me is whether he, was a victim of child abuse, whether he was a drug addict, whether he had a bad marriage, whether he had a brain tumor, um, whether he was mistreated in the military. Um, these are all you know, valid questions, but the big question when it comes to Charles Whitman is why did he do it and what makes it okay? And the second part of it, I don't think there's anything that makes it okay, and the first part of it, there are millions of people who've had brain tumors. There are millions of people who've lived through child Absolutely. abuse. So that's why I don't, those questions have been asked and I don't feel like there's a, a significant answer that settles the unrest within us when we want to know why. But the questions that weren't being asked were who were the people who survived, who were the people we lost. That's why, that's why we focus there. Thank you so much. Great sure. piece of work. Yes, ma'am. That was an incredibly meaty film. Thank you. There's so much to talk about with that. Um, one of the things that stood out to me most were the comments about courage and, and cowardice. And I wonder if any of the people, any of the survivors who talked about feeling like cowards, especially the woman, I've forgotten her name. Yeah, Brenda. Have their views about themselves changed after seeing this film? That's a good, good question. Um, I don't think Brenda's has. She's pretty, um, you know, what's interesting about her is that you know, we, we set a very narrow, dramatic parameter for the telling that we wanted to tell, so I don't get, you don't get to explore who she went on to become. But that woman, Brenda Bell, went on to become a journalist, and through her journalism career, she focused on shooting incidents, school shootings, and she reported on the tower shooting on its anniversaries every 10 years. Um, I think she always sees herself as a coward but she feels like that's what led her to become a journalist, and I think she would say journalists are cowards who can't stop looking, and they need to report back what they found. Um, I don't agree with her. I don't agree with her that journalists are cowards. I don't agree with her that she's a coward. I think she was a smart person who made self-preservation her goal. Um, but I do know that Artley, who expresses a lot of guilt, um, he just said this to me yesterday when we were together in Los Angeles. He didn't know until he'd seen the film how universal it was to feel guilty about surviving something. Mm -hmm. Even when he'd done such an incredibly brave act himself, he was beating himself up over it that he hadn't done it fast enough or sooner. Um, after seeing Houston McCoy express regret, after hearing Ray Martinez, who doesn't do it in the film, but does in real life tell us something he never told me in the interview, but he told me after the film's premiere, he feels regret that he ran past Claire and Tom on the pavement to get to the tower. Um, he made that decision not to help those people, but to get to the top of the tower to end the, the thing. Yeah, he prevented more Claire's and Tom's. And I, that's what I told him, mm -hmm. but he said still every night, he, he has that picture of Claire laying there, and he had trained as a medic in the army and knew that he could have done something to help. I think that's a very universal, and I think it's a real human thing. Any of us who have survived trauma of any kind, not school, just school shootings, but any kind of significant loss, family, tragedy, um, rape, abuse, 
it's a complicated thing to be a human being, and, and this guilt seems to be one of the main things that's left behind as a residual. And if the film helps people confront that guilt in any way, then it's a, it's a success. Well, we're running low on time. I just want to be selfish and ask one more. Oh, if I, yes, go ahead, sir. I had a question for you. Um, did Claire ever remarry or ever find another significant other? Yeah, the question is, did Claire ever remarry? Um, she did. She married and divorced and married and divorced. She told me that Tom was the love of her life and she was always seeking to replace him and she never did. Um, she also told me that it wasn't until last year and seeing the film that it ever occurred to her that maybe she and Tom might have broken up someday. <laughs> um, you know, she was 18. And I was always so struck by, there's nothing like teenage love. Yeah. And, you know, that she and Tom may have been perfect for each other and they may have stayed together forever, or they may have broken up the week after that. Um, but she lost Tom at the height of that love and she'll never... But it still kind of lives there, that's, right? That's the gift, I yeah. think, of that. Um, and she sees it that way, Tragic too. gift. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. just going to say, I've had a little bit of trauma in my life, and uh, I know that letting things out and reflecting on things is it's kind of the best healer in life, and uh, you know, I think that's something that I got out of your film. Is, yeah, reflecting on things is definitely a way to, to heal, and we need to have a society that's more open to expression and stuff like that. But yeah. anyway, thank you. That I agree. Thank you. Film. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you if Cronkite was right, and if the crimes of that day are our own, as he says, and I ask you, it's, it might be kind of an unfair question, um, but I think you're speaking to it a bit in the editing of the film around the Cronkite speech. What do you think the frequency and, and increasing frequency of, the, of violence and mass shootings in our world says about our society? If, if Cronkite was right, do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, but I don't have a great answer. Um, I'll tell you this, I was seeking Cronkite's voice when we were making this film for a couple reasons. Um, to me, he's the voice of the 20th century. And he went to the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. So I assumed if I found his broadcast from that night, he might say something personal. Might say, oh, when I walked on the 40 acres, which is what they call the campus. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna do my Cronkite impression. But, <laughs> um, and we had a hard time finding that footage. We found very quickly the ABC Nightly News and the NBC David Brinkley report from that night, but we couldn't find Cronkite for a long time. And we finally found him just only a, a little over a year ago in the final phase of our edit. And it really blew me away what he had to say because it wasn't some uh, nostalgic look back at his time at the campus. It was a super prescient view. Only six hours after the shooting ended, he, he saw it already. diagnosed yeah. mm -hmm. this. Now, whether you agree with him or not, is this society's fault? We all are entitled to our opinion. Um, I think what he says aligns perfectly with what Claire says. Claire sees Whitman as a innocent three-year-old, and we know that at 25, he is a conflicted and damaged individual who terrorized so many people. And somewhere between those two ages, something happened. Um, I didn't showcase the footage of Columbine and, and, and the other shootings mm -hmm. in that scene to just kind of beat you over the head to say, look, these shootings keep happening because you were already thinking that. You were thinking that before you came in here tonight and you thought that as you watched the movie. I know that, you're smart. I showed those faces of those teenagers to say Claire's story, Artley's story, is their story too. And when these shootings happen, what we do as a mm -hmm. culture, as individuals, we say, oh, there's a shooting. Did you hear? Where did it happen? It happened in Orlando. How many were killed? There were 50. And we all get flabbergasted, we get frustrated, we shake our heads, and then we change the channel. Mm -hmm. Because it's too much to deal with, because it feels out of our hands, because it feels beyond our reach. And I just wanted to say, it's not out of our reach if we look at these people as individuals and if we 
honor them as, as individual humane beings. I, I, I can't stop these shootings, but somebody out there can. Mm -hmm. And I, wanted, I want to reach out to that person that's smarter, whether it's policymakers, um, whether it's people associated with, with gun culture, um, whether it's people in the sociological um, fields or people who raise children. I think we all have a hand in it. That's what society is. And so, you know, you said it's seemingly more frequently. That's not inaccurate. There have mm -hmm. been 200 mass shootings like this since 1966, and 150 of them have happened in this century. Wow. What mm -hmm. about our neighbors? What about them? Like, we should be more involved. Yeah. Well, and that's what we, I think it's up to us each. I, I don't disagree. We each need to come up with a way to address this. I don't have the answers. Well, well the, but. the society that Cronkite is indicting is also the one that gave us Artley Snuffs and Claire's and Rita's Absolutely. and Carlos Martinez's. They're the people who, for some reason, were inspired by something they encountered in their lives. You know, it may not have been a violent video game or a violent movie, or it may have been a hug from a friend or something that made them think about going out there and helping somebody. So maybe there's another side to the Cronkite speech. I think there is. Um, we are all, the thing is, there's way more Rita Star patterns than there are Charles Whitman's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There always will be. I'm an optimist, and I believe we have it within us to solve this, um, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate that we're in it together. Um, it's frustrating, you know, you, I'd love to have made a film that, that has the answers, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't. But I wanted to make a film that, that raises the questions and, and sparks the conversation. Um, nothing makes me prouder about this film then when I stand in the lobby after it's done and I hear people walk out and, and, and debate this, this very question, mm -hmm. um, it's through that debate that we will find answers. And it's through being good neighbors, being good parents, being good stewards of humanity and treating each other well. What kind of rating did your film get and how come you didn't push for a theatrical release? Um, good question. Uh, <laughs> The film was theatrically released and has been released in over 30 cities in the United States. Um, and as far as rating, most documentaries aren't rated by the Motion Picture Association of America, and neither is ours. But it was rated by, um, oh, what's it called? That group that, of parents that tell everybody what to think. What? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. They're good people, uh, but they, they make mean it, well. <laughs> uh, they said it's, it's appropriate for 14 year olds and up is what some council decided. <laughs> um, and uh, so yeah, I mean the film has had a robust distribution and will continue to. Um, we've been, like I said, it's an art house film. Uh, we have a small distributor, um, but we've played in 30 cities around the country. We're playing in lots of film societies like we are here with y'all. Played in lots of film festivals. Played in more international film festivals than domestic, which I'm proud of. <laughs> um, and it's not just because foreigners want to shake their head at Americans being um, ridiculous gun toters, um, though we are. Partly. No. Um, but, uh, but. What did you gross? Uh, what did you make this year? Maybe that's a question for after, for after. I'm sorry, I don't think that's an appropriate question and I'm not gonna answer it. <laughs> Any, we, let's just take one more brief one, please. Claire says it happened. She asked about the heartless man. The man we call him the man in the suit. Mm -hmm. um, Claire described him as a man in the suit who walked by. Um, yeah, I found. I'm not sure if that happened, but Claire says it happened, and uh, and you know the thing is, it's a, it's a sign of the times. There's lots of little clues in the film that I think different people pick up on, and some people don't. Um, Claire was a member of the Students for a Democratic Society. It was a radical um, group of activists. Um, that group had been hosting guerrilla theater tactics on campus to demonstrate against the Vietnam War. And I think students had actually laid down and pretended to be dead before that. Um, and so he may have thought that that's what was going on. We're not quite sure. Okay, well thank you. Can I make a comment? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. And this, this is our last comment. You know, uh, I wish I would have known there was going to be all these uh, gunshots throughout your movie. Uh, that was tough. Uh, 
have, having uh, experienced trauma. Um, I appreciate uh, your film, but I think it's important to understand that Mr. Whitman had some very serious mental health problems before he went in the Marine Corps and after. And your movie focuses on victims. Well, I think he, he spoke to, to why that was the case, though, right? No, I, I think that, I'm not mm -hmm. critical. I think it's important. There are a lot of victims of gun violence. You know, I served in the, in the drug wars in Mexico, Colombia, and all those countries. And there's thousands of people being slaughtered in those countries because of the drug abuse in this country, because our demand for it. And having seen a lot of these people slaughtered as we were sent there to help train them and, and so on and so forth. But the focus on the victim is important to us. Uh, in your film, it may not be important overall, but it is because oftentimes we focus more on the on the criminal or, or the monstrous sack that's been committed. So I, I, I applaud you uh, for doing that. Uh, thank you. Right. Right. Thank you. With that, thank you very much, Keith Raymond. Thank you for joining us.